Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on working safely during coronavirus. My name is Andy Harrison and I'm from the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. This webinar offers guidance to help employers, employees and the self-employed working in labs and research facilities to understand how to work safely during the coronavirus pandemic. There are controls at the bottom of your screen to pause the session and for adjusting video quality and sound. You can ask questions during the webinar by selecting the Q&A symbol on the right hand side of your screen, typing your question in the compose box and then selecting send. As every business is different, we can't answer questions or give advice on exactly how you should implement the guidance in your specific circumstances, but we can collect your feedback and input on how useful the guidance is for your business and areas we might want to develop in future iterations. A recording of this webinar and links to useful information will be circulated to all participants later today. The purpose of today's webinar is to give you a practical framework to think about what you need to do to continue or restart operations during the COVID-19 pandemic. To help you do this, Guidance for Businesses has been prepared by the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, with input from firms, industry bodies, unions and the devolved administrations in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, along with consultation with Public Health England and the Health and Safety Executive. This guidance applies to England. The links to this guidance and for the guidance for Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland Search for working safely during coronavirus on gov.uk. We expect that this guidance will be updated over time and you should check for updates at www.gov.uk forward slash working safely. This guidance should provide a practical framework to think about what is required to continue or restart operations. Each business will need to translate this into the specific actions it needs to take, depending on the nature of the business, including the size and type of business, how it's organised, operated, managed and regulated. You could also consider any advice that's been produced specifically for your sector, for example, by trade associations or trade unions. Guidance does not supersede any legal obligations relating to health and safety, employment or equalities as well as providing guidance to businesses on working safely during coronavirus, the government is supporting businesses and their employees with a package of measures during this period of unprecedented disruption. The Coronavirus Business Support Hub brings together all government guidance on running your business. To visit the hub, search business support on gov.uk. You can use the business support finder tool on gov.uk to see what support is available for you and your business. Answer nine questions and receive a list of support your businesses may be entitled to. Gov.uk is where you'll also find written guidance to help employers, employees and the self-employed understand how to work safely during the coronavirus pandemic. Eight guides have been published covering a range of different types of work. Many businesses operate more than one type of workplace, such as an office, factory and a fleet of vehicles. So you may need to use more than one of the guides as you think through what you need to do to keep people safe. You can view all the written guidance at www.gov.uk forward slash working safely. Further guidance will be published as more businesses are able to reopen. So today's webinar is designed to be relevant for people who work in labs and research facilities. This includes indoor research environments such as engineering centres, clean rooms, wet labs, computer labs and specialist testing rooms. I'm delighted to be joined today by Lysi Lai, who will introduce the guidance on how to work safely in these environments, looking at practical considerations of how the guidance can be applied in the workplace. Today we will cover how you might assess and manage risk, who should go to work, how to enable social distancing at work, managing non-staff at your workplace, including customers, 
visitors and contractors. How to reinforce your cleaning measures to reduce transmission risk. PPE and coverings in your workplace. Managing and communicating with your workforce and handling inbound and outbound bids. Lysi, over to you. Thank you, Andy. I'm here today to provide an overview of the labs and research facilities guidance on how to work safely. Labs and research facilities require on-site collaboration between people, often working closely uh, in close proximity. The lab environment often means that flexibility of both shifts and floor layouts may be limited. There is often also high use of multiple use items such as testing machines and apparatus, and not all of this equipment can be washed down. While these workplace attributes can pose challenges, lab safety is always a top priority, and dealing with this new COVID-19 risk should be thought of in the context of your existing legal responsibility to protect your workers and others from risk to their health and safety. This means you need to think about the risks they face and do everything reasonably practicable to minimise them. I'm sure you're already aware that a risk assessment is part of how you control risks in your workplace and can use the guidance produced by the government to help ensure that the risk assessment for your business also addresses the risk of COVID-19 and puts appropriate preventative measures in place. All employers should consult their workers on health and safety. The health and safety executive have useful tools and guidance on conducting a risk assessment. You should share the results of your risk assessment with your workforce. In the context of coronavirus, mitigating risks means increasing hand washing and cleaning of surfaces, work from home where possible, and where this is not possible, maintaining social distances of two metres. Where maintaining social distancing isn't possible, consider whether the specific activities should continue. If these activities should continue, you should put in place preventative measures that I will cover in further detail. Remember that no one is obliged to work in an unsafe environment. It is important that employers feel confident that they are protecting the well-being of their workers and for workers to feel confident they are being protected at work. As we move on to looking to implementing the guidance, the first area to consider is who should go to work. Everyone who can work from home should continue to do so. You should carefully consider who is needed to be on site. For example, workers in roles critical for business and operational continuity, safe facility management or regulatory requirements and which cannot be performed remotely. Workers in critical roles which might be performed remotely but who are unable to work remotely due to the unavailability of specialist equipment required. You should plan for the minimum number of people needed on site to operate safely and effectively. This might mean modifying schedules or staggering shifts. You might also want to consider asking staff with non-lab related activities to work from home. For example, writing or data analysis as it might meet business needs while helping achieve social distancing. Where people are working from home, employers should monitor their well-being and keep in touch with off-site workers on their working arrangements and provide equipment such as remote access to work systems. Individuals who advise to stay at home under existing guidance should not physically come to work. People who are at higher risks should be protected. This includes the clinically extremely vulnerable category who are strongly advised not to work outside the home and the clinically vulnerable individuals who are at higher risk of severe illness and have been asked to take extra care in observing social distancing. These individuals should be helped to work from home, either in their current role or in an alternative role where this is possible. Individuals and individuals who have symptoms of COVID-19, as well as those who live in a household with someone who has symptoms. 
When applying this guidance, employers should be mindful to treat everyone in the workplace equally, considering the needs of different groups of workers or individuals. It is against the law to discriminate directly or indirectly against anyone because of a protected characteristic such as age, sex or disability. I'll now move on to talk about social distancing and mitigating actions to reduce transmission in the workplace for those who cannot work from home. Labs and R&D facilities may be designed for close proximity collaboration and that as a result, it will not always be possible to keep a distance of two metres. Where the social distancing guidelines cannot be followed in full in relation to a particular activity, businesses should consider whether that activity needs to continue for the business to operate. If it is not possible to keep a distance of two metres and the activity does need to continue, you should take all mitigating actions possible to reduce the risk of transmission between staff. I'll now go into some more detail on the actions you should consider. Remember that social distancing applies to all parts of the business, not just the place where people spend most of the time, but also areas like entrances and exits, break rooms and canteens. These slides highlight some steps that will usually be needed to maintain social distancing wherever possible when people are coming to and leaving work and when they're moving around buildings. You might want to think about one, staggering arrival and departure times, using markings and introducing multiple entry points to reduce congestion, introducing a one-way flow into, out of and through buildings, Exclusive entry and exit points should be considered for personnel working in high risk areas such as mechanical test sites and wet labs. Think about regulating the use of high traffic areas, including corridors, turnstiles, walkways and lifts, and encourage the use of stairs and reducing maximum occupancy of lifts. You could consider using markings such as those illustrated here. Where possible, you should also reduce non-essential trips within and between buildings or sites to help maintain social distancing. For example, by restricting access between different areas of buildings or sites and encouraging the use of radios and telephones. Introduce booking processes to reduce the number of people in the lab to prevent overcrowding. Provide alternatives to touch based security devices such as keypads where you can and remove access controls so people do not have to use access cards where this is possible. At entry and exit points, hand washing facilities should be, be, be provided or hand sanitizer should be provided where this is not possible. You should also think about providing storage for workers' clothes and bags, requesting staff change into work clothing on site using appropriate facilities where the social distancing and hygiene guidelines can be met, and washing lab equipment and, equip and clothing on site rather than by individual staff members at home. Now, moving on to look at fixed workstations and equipment. You must assign workstations and equipment to individuals where possible. If they need to be shared, you should, they should be shared by the smallest possible of peak number of people. To maintain social distancing, workstations should be two metres apart. You should look to change layouts to create new space where there is where it is practical. Where equipment is fixed or layouts cannot be changed, you should first consider whether the activity needs to continue for the business to operate. Where this is the case, arrange for people to work side by side or facing away from each other, install screens and place greater emphasis on cleaning and hygiene. 
you should also manage occup occupancy levels in labs. For example, adapt booking systems to limit usage, limit use of high touch items and shared office equipment. For example, test equipment, apparatus, shared control terminals. Ensure appropriate air handling and filtering systems are installed and maintained in high risk areas where there is a risk of airborne particles. The examples here show preventative measures put in place to mitigate the risk of transmission. The image demonstrates reduced occupancy levels in labs and the bottom image is an example of seating with two meters side by side and back to back. It is also important to maintain social distancing and reduce the risk of transmission in meetings and common areas. Remote working tools should be used to avoid in-person meetings and only necessary participants should attend and maintain a two metre separation throughout. Participants should avoid sharing materials and hand sanitizer should be provided in meeting rooms. To maintain social distancing while using common areas, you should consider staggering break times, using outdoor outside areas, using protective screens for staff, reconfiguring seating and table to maintain social distancing and reduce face to face interactions or encouraging storage of personal items and clothing in personal storage spaces, for example, lockers during working hours. Establishing ways to deal with accidents and other incidents such as a chemical spill or fire safety should be prioritized. In an emergency, people do not have to stay two meters apart if this would be un unsafe to do so. People involved in the provision of assistance should pay attention to sanitization measures immediately afterwards including washing hands. The images shown here are examples of meeting rooms and common areas that have been restricted for use and overlaid with clear visual markers to encourage social distancing and good hygiene. When considering how to apply this guidance, remember to take into account visitors, customers, agency workers, contractors, and other people, as well as your employees. You should minimise the number of unnecessary visits to offices and labs and make sure people understand what they need to do to maintain safety. This can be achieved by encouraging visits via remote connection or remote working for visitors, where this is an option, limiting the number of visitors at any one time Determining if schedules for essential services and contractor visits can be revised to reduce interaction and overlap between people, for example, by carrying out services at night. Revising visitor arrangements to ensure social distancing and hygiene, for example, not using the same, same pen by people physically signing in at receptions. To ensure people understand what they need to do to maintain safety, the following steps will usually be required. Providing clear guidance on social distancing and hygiene, reviewing entry and exit routes for visitors and contractors to minimise contact with other people, coordinating and working collaboratively with landlords and other areas of facility sites, for example, where R&D facilities or labs are situated on science parks. I'll now move on to look at cleaning and hygiene. Make sure that sites and locations that have been closed or partially operating, operated are clean and ready to restart. Before reopening, you should check whether you need to service or adjust ventilation systems. Most air conditioning systems will not need adjustment. However, with systems serve multiple buildings or you are unsure, advice should be sought from your HVAC engineers. 
and restart and test specialist equipment which may have been unused for longer than usual period of time. Once reopened, workplaces should be kept clean to prevent transmission by touching contaminated surfaces. This will require frequent work cleaning of work areas and equipment between users using your usual cleaning products. Determining the required cleaning process for expensive equipment that cannot be washed down. Designing protection around machines and equipment. Frequent cleaning of objects and surfaces that are touched regularly, such as door handles and testing surfaces. And make sure that they're adequate safe disposal arrangements. Providing hand sanitizer in multiple locations in addition to washrooms. Help everyone ensure good hygiene through the working day by providing reminders and signage to maintain hygiene standards and providing hand sanitizer or hand washing and hand drying facilities in multiple locations. Setting clear and clear use and cleaning guidance for showers, lockers, toilets and changing rooms to ensure they are kept clear and clean of personal items and that social distancing is achieved as much as possible. Introducing enhanced cleaning of all facilities regularly during the day and at the end of the day. Where objects come into the workplace, such as goods, materials and on-site vehicles, you should look to reduce transmission through contact as much as possible. This may require the introduction of cleaning procedures for material and equipment entering the site, the introduction of cleaning procedures for the parts of shared equipment you touch after each use, the introduction of cleaning procedures for vehicles, restricting non-essential deliveries for example, personal deliveries to workers. Now let's look at personal protective equipment, PPE. As you'll already be aware in the lab setting, PPE protects the user against health or safety risks at work, including items like gloves, eye protection and face masks. Where you are already using such equipment to protect against non-COVID-19 risks, you should continue to do so. However, additional PPE beyond what you usually wear is not required to protect against COVID-19. While there may be circumstances where wearing face coverings may be marginally beneficial as a precautionary measure against coronavirus, such as when working in enclosed spacing, this should not be at the expense of other ways of managing risks that I have been setting out. These next slides look at workforce management. When thinking about workforce management, the objective should be to change the way work is organized in order to create distinct groups and to reduce the number of contacts each worker has. Where workers cannot work alone, you should look to fix teams or shift groups so that where contact is unavoidable, this happens between the same people. You should identify areas where people directly pass things to each other, for example, test subjects, and find ways to remove this direct contact, such as using put down pick up processes. When thinking work related travel, you should begin by minimizing all non essential travel and consider use, using remote options instead. If travelling for work is essential, consider the, consider the following steps. Minimise the number of people travelling together in any one vehicle. Use fixed travel partners, avoid sitting face to face and increase ventilation when possible by opening windows. Clean shared vehicles between shifts or on handover. You should also implement procedures to minimise person to person contact during deliveries to other sites. All workers should understand COVID-19 related safety procedure. Use clear, consistent and regular communication, 
simple, clear messaging and visual communications should be used to explain any changes. Engage with workers and worker representatives to explain any changes in ways of working and to monitor and understand any unforeseen changes and develop communications and training materials around new procedures. My final slide today looks at social distancing and avoiding service transmission when goods enter and leave sites. There are a number of steps that you may need to take here, including revising pick up and drop off collection points, minimizing unnecessary contact, reducing the frequency of deliveries, having single workers load or unload vehicles where safe to do so, using the same pairs of people for loads where more than one is needed, enabling drivers to access welfare facilities, encouraging drivers to stay in their vehicles where this does not compromise safety and existing safe working practices. I hope this information has provided you with a useful starting point for how to think about assessing and managing the risks of COVID-19. You should refer to the guidance documents as you think about the practical considerations of how these can be applied in your workplace, depending on the nature and operations of your business. Thank you for listening. I'll now hand back to Andy. Thank you for that very helpful overview, Lysi. So before we move on, to look at some case studies and questions on the safer working guidance. I wanted to outline some of the wider steps the government has taken to help people travel to work and on the opening of nurseries, schools and colleges that will also help people return to the workplace. So from today, primary schools in England will be welcoming back children in reception, year one and year six. Nurseries and other early year providers will also begin welcoming back children of all ages. Secondary schools, sixth forms and colleges will also provide face-to-face -face contact for year 10, year 12 and equivalent 16 to 19 year old further education students to help them prepare for exams next year. It is expected this will begin from the 15th of June with around a quarter of those secondary students in at any point. The latest information on phased reopening of schools can be found at gov.uk. Safe travel guidance is also available and you should share this with your workforce to help them plan their travel to work during the coronavirus outbreak. Everybody should avoid using public transport where possible and instead try to walk, cycle or drive. Thinking carefully about the times, routes and ways your employees travel will also mean we will all have more space to stay safe. The travel guidance for passengers can be found at UK. Although the specific actions you will take may differ, it might be useful to consider how other businesses are preparing. I'd now like to show a very short video that looks at some of the actions that Ambridge Ceramics Dental Laboratory are taking to implement the guidance in their workplace. Hello, my name is Mark Ambridge and I'm the Managing Director of Ambridge Ceramics Dental Laboratory in uh, Ripon, North Yorkshire. In anticipation of the distancing issues in, in the full team coming back to work, um, we, we have introduced specific measures to ensure we can still undertake our work safely, uh, such as uh, maintaining at least two metres apart. Um, we have clear plastic shielding on all the workstations. Um, uh, we're using a one-way system marked out on the carpet with, um, with, with passing places at junctions um, and bringing pre-prepared um, meals for individual staggered lunch breaks and thoroughly cleaning any shared equipment. Hello. So every workplace is different and of course each business will need to translate the guidance into specific actions according to the nature of the business, including the size and type of business and how it's organised, operated, managed and regulated. The Coronavirus Business Support Blog provides further useful examples that you may wish to review. Industry bodies and unions may also be able to provide you with useful information 
as you think through and review your safer working plans. The government is working closely with business representative organisations and trade associations to support the national response to coronavirus. At gov.uk, you can find a list of some of the business representative organisations and trade associations that are providing coronavirus related support for specific sectors and who you can speak with to get advice. Many of these websites also include sector specific guidance and Q&A. Many of these organisations are also happy to respond to non-member queries related to coronavirus. So before we close today, uh, Lysi and I will address some of the common questions that businesses are raising on the guidance. So we'll start our questions today by looking at PPE and some questions from those who are asking about how to manage regular PPE use in the new context. For example, one question asks, we already use PPE in labs. What does that mean for managing the risk of the virus? Lysi. Good question. Many labs and research facilities will already be using PPE in the course of their usual work. Where this is not the where this is the case and you're using PPE to manage risks that do not relate to coronavirus, you should continue to do so. Unless you are in a situation where the risk of COVID-19 transmission is very high, your risk assessment should reflect the fact that the role of PPE in providing additional protection is extremely limited. If you operate in a clinical environment, particular guidance on PPE is available on the Personal Protective Equipment Hub on the .gov.uk website. If your risk assessment does show that PPE is required, then you must provide this PPE free of charge to workers who need it. Any PPE provided must be fitted properly. If your risk assessment does not require PPE, but you do provide face coverings as a precaution, or if your workers do choose to wear one, you should provide advice on how to do so safely. More detail on the safety advice for the wearing of face coverings is available in the online guidance. Thanks, Lacey. Uh, another question looking now at lab equipment. Uh, the question asks, what advice do you have for the arrangement and cleaning of equipment that may be specialised, difficult, or impossible to move, or that may require more than one member of staff to operate? Mm. When you're thinking about the use of the equipment and where the social distancing guidelines cannot be followed in full, your first step must be to consider whether the activity needs to continue for the business to operate. Where it needs to continue, then look to take mitigating actions. These could include keeping the activity time involved as short as possible, using screens or barriers to separate people, using back-to-back -back or side-to-side -side working, and using fixed teams or partnering where people work together. You should also increase the frequency of hand washing and surface cleaning, and look at ways of reducing contact between people who do work together and reduce direct contact where it is possible. For example, this might include using put down pick up processes rather than staff passing items to one another directly. Thanks, Lysi. Um, our next question uh, is a related question on cleaning surfaces. Uh, the questioner asks, my security processes require people to enter a pin using a keyboard, uh, sorry, a keypad. Is this still allowed? So as a first step, you should review any touch based security systems and consider if other options are available. For example, it might be possible to require staff to show security passes to a guard who is able to check it in a socially distanced manner. Where you do need to retain keypads and other touch based devices, you should frequently clean these surfaces as well as provide hand sanitizer and hand washing facilities. OK, we've also had a question about uh, employers and businesses testing their staff for coronavirus. What do businesses need to do, Lysi? The NHS test and trace service in England and similar systems in the devolved nations need to ensure that uh, ensure that anyone who develops symptoms of coronavirus can quickly be tested to find out if they have the virus. 
It also helps trace close recent contacts of anyone who tested positive for coronavirus and if necessary, notifies those contacts that they must also self-isolate at home to help stop the spread of the virus. Employers do not need to conduct their own testing, but it is vital that they play their part by making their workplaces as safe as possible, encouraging workers with any symptoms to use the service and to heed any notification to self-isolate. Employers should continue to communicate with workers in self-isolation and provide support to them. This includes allowing people to work from home if they remain well and if it is practicable to do so. This might include finding alternative work that can be completed at home during the period of self-isolation. If people cannot work from home, employers must ensure any self-isolating employees is receiving sick pay and to give them the option to use their paid leave days if they prefer. These steps will help to stop the onward spread of the virus in the workplace and in wider society so that fewer people develop coronavirus. Thank you, Lucy. So that ends our question and answer session for today. Later this week, we will circulate further information on popular questions that have been asked across the series of webinars. A recording of the webinar and links to useful information will also be circulated to all participants later today. As we expect that this guidance will be updated over time, you should also continue to check for updates at www.gov.uk forward slash working safely. To stay up to date with the latest business information on coronavirus directly to your inbox, sign up to the Coronavirus Business and Employers Bulletin. You can also contact the government's business support helplines and you can find all coronavirus business support information on gov.uk. So it just remains for me to thank our speaker, Lysi, and to thank you all for joining us today. Goodbye.